purpose of the second panel um, is to focus on the campaign finance and the ethics portions of the bill, where the first panel was focused on the voting portions of the bill. Each witness will now be recognized for five minutes uh, for their opening statement, and we will begin with the Honorable Mr. Potter. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar and Senator Blunt, for the honor of appearing before you today in support of S-1, the For the People Act. The Campaign Legal Center, of which I am president, is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing American democracy through law. Many of S-1's provisions have bipartisan origins and have broad bipartisan public support, with majorities of voters from both parties saying they back provisions in the legislation. I do not believe this bill benefits one party over the other, but it does benefit the American people by making their government and election process more accessible and transparent. Let me give you a few examples of the bipartisan roots of key provisions of S-1. The FEC reform provisions are drawn from a bipartisan bill introduced in the last three Congresses. Digital disclosure provisions are drawn from the Honest Ads Act, introduced in the last two Congresses with bipartisan support, and reforms to strengthen the Foreign Agents Registration Act have a similar bipartisan background. Super PAC coordination provisions echo those included in bipartisan bills and are similar to bipartisan state measures, such as a 2019 bill introduced in West Virginia by a Republican state senator and passed with bipartisan support signed into law by that state's Republican governor. Provisions that would end shadow lobbying track the bipartisan bills previously introduced and implement recommendations from a bipartisan American Bar Association task force. I would like to note one critical component of S-1 that CLC believes is particularly important, reform of the FEC. The Federal Election Commission has grown deeply dysfunctional and our democracy is suffering as a result. During my time at the FEC, I remember only one agency deadlock on an enforcement matter. Deadlocks now occur with great frequency, almost routinely if the matter has significant political or legal importance. My written testimony to this committee details the rise of these deadlocks over the last decade and the numbers are stark. Some will try to argue that things aren't as bad as the record shows, but in doing so, they play games, using numbers that equate routine commission votes, such as approving the minutes, with votes on major enforcement matters. Or they average commission votes over the FEC's whole history, when the deadlocks are almost all in the last 10 years. The failure of the FEC to muster a majority in recent years to enforce campaign finance laws has resulted in an explosion in secret spending by C4s and other groups that do not disclose their donors. In the 2020 election cycle, dark money groups spent $1 billion in political advertising or other expenditures, including $600 million transferred to super PACs to spend, thereby blatantly laundering the money to prevent disclosure of the donors. The open involvement of federal candidates and office holders in raising funds for their supposedly independent super PACs raises the very real danger of corruption. Some people will tell you that FEC commissioners who refuse to support transparency are only protecting First Amendment rights. But the Supreme Court ruled 8-1 in Citizens United that knowing the source of funding of political advertising is a crucial right of voters, requiring groups like Citizens United, which was not a political committee, to disclose their donors is constitutional, the Supreme Court said in that case. 
Yet the FEC has repeatedly deadlocked on disclosure issues, whether to write regulations implementing the disclosure holdings of Citizens United or in multiple enforcement matters involving disclosure. S1 would therefore restructure the FEC to address well-documented problems by changing the number of FEC commissioners, improving the commissioner selection process, strengthening the enforcement process to prevent commissioners from deadlocking on making investigations at an early stage, and making meaningful judicial review of FEC action or inaction easier. I believe these changes will allow the FEC to function as the crucial and effective watchdog it needs to be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, uh, we have the Honorable Lee Goodman. Thank you. Am I? Can you hear me now? Yep, we could hear you before. You're OK. Um, outweighs many of the benefits of the bill. I also believe that the bill misfires and uh, 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 is inadequate in many ways to address. For example, in the foreign meddling uh, uh, approach uh, using the honest ads provisions. The central feature of the bill that I believe makes the bill objectionable uh, for the American people are, uh, is its vast expansion of the type of speech Americans wish to engage in subjecting them to public uh, and compulsory disclosure and doxing. Uh, and it does that in two central ways. First, it imposes on the uh, compulsory exposure regime of the FEC uh, a requirement that citizens disclose who they are, who their donors are, who their members are, any time they make a campaign-related disbursement uh, in an election cycle of $10,000 or more. And a campaign-related disbursement is defined as any, even, uh, any uh, communication, any public communication, that would include pamphlets, direct mail, robocalls, TV broadcast, online, any time somebody funds a public communication even if it is focused solely on legislation, but it nevertheless mentions a politician in connection with that legislation in a favorable or unfavorable light, also known as the PASO standard, uh, uh, promote, attack, support, or oppose. That is an extremely vague standard uh, uh, on which to regulate the American people's desire to speak and to exercise their First Amendment right to speak if they so choose anonymously on policy and issues. Uh, and uh, you don't have to look very far in the law to find good examples of how vague that standard is. It would, it would represent a vast expansion of speech regulation in America to everyday, ordinary policy speech. And the second area that this bill expands uh, public compulsory disclosure and exposure of citizens and groups when they want to speak is under the honest ads provisions. The honest ads provisions require that any time an individual organization desires to speak about any matter of public policy in the bill, it discusses issues of national importance. Anytime you want to spend $500 to do so online, you must disclose who you are. You must disclose the leaders of your organization, your address, details about your communication to the public. And so these, uh, and, and yet it does so uh, under the, um, under the uh, purported interest of preventing foreign meddling and yet it targets the speech of American citizens and it imposes on American media companies all new liability, both civil and criminal liability, because one bill makes American media companies both the policemen of foreign speech that might end up on their online platforms and subjects them to potential criminal sanctions if they fail to do so. Um, so while it starts as a proposal for Russian meddling, 
it imposes restrictions on all American citizens and media companies. It is under-inclusive to even effectively address active measures by foreign countries because it covers only paid ads, not the free posts that occur on uh, social media. It, uh, up, it uh, affects only large platforms, and yet there are thousands of smaller platforms that reach hundreds of millions of Americans. It does not address that. And it does not address print media, direct mail, robocalls, and other forms of communications. Um, it imposes all new uh, standards on uh, media companies, and it also has a fundamental contradiction with the Foreign Agents Registration Act, which exempts the media for carrying foreign propaganda. And U.S. courts have ruled this law unconstitutional, or very, excuse me, a very similar law in Maryland. All of this expansion of uh, speech regulation must be understood in the current context and the times in which we live where we have heightened political polarization and intolerance in America because that informs the degree of chill and restriction on actual speech that will, will occur if this expansion of speech regulation takes effect. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, and our uh, next witness, uh, Mr. Wertheimer. To testify today. I also want to thank uh, Senate Majority Leader Schumer, uh, lead sponsor Senator Merkley, and Chairwoman Klobuchar for their leadership uh, on S-1, which we consider uh, an essential bill for democracy reform. Uh, there's nothing new about m the campaign finance proposals in S-1. I testified before this committee in 2012 for the Disclose Act. Uh, the major campaign finance provisions have been before the, 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 the Congress and the Senate at least since 2017 and earlier in many other cases. Uh, campaign finance reform proposals uh, were passed in the House in 2019. I testified before the House Administration Committee. Uh, the Senate majority in the last Congress chose not to consider this bill or not to hold hearings. I first testified before this committee in this room in 1973. Uh, as I was waiting to testify, uh, I, a newly elected senator, Senator Joe Biden of Delaware, uh, testified and spoke on behalf of public financing of elections. He described public financing as the swiftest and surest way to purge our election systems of the corruption that whatever the safeguards, money inevitably brings. Senator Biden continued to be a leading voice for public financing of elections throughout his career. Congress enacted the presidential public financing system in 1974 with a bipartisan vote, and after the Senate twice had passed a similar bill, that was blocked by the House. The new system worked well for decades. Almost every major party candidate used this system for seven elections. Three Republicans and two Democrats were elected president using this system. Uh, president Ronald Reagan benefited most from this system, using it three times. The RNC and the DNC voluntarily requested and, and accepted public funds uh, f uh, for their, to help finance their convention for decades. The system broke down in 2000 when the growth of uh, the costs of campaigns simply outweighed the benefits that the system provided, and Congress n never revised the system. The campaign finance system today is flooded with funds coming from influence-seeking billionaires, millionaires, lobbyists, bundlers, business executives, dark money groups, super PACs, and special interest PACs. As a result of Supreme Court decisions, the American people have been treated to the spectacle 
of the top donor and his spouse in the 2020 elections, giving $218 million, $218 million to influence the 2020 elections. The next leading individual donors provided $153 million, $72 million, $68 million, and $67 million, respectively. The top 100 donors to super PACs provided $2.1 billion. The national median family income in the United States in fiscal 2020 was $78,500. The current system may benefit the interest of the donors, the super PACs, the dark money nonprofits, and the candidates being supported, but it does not benefit the interests of the American people. ESWA addresses this problem by providing an alternative financing system that gives candidates the option, the voluntary option, to finance their campaigns with small contributions matched at a six to one ratio. Uh, there's a big difference between the presidential system and this system. The presidential system was financed with tax revenues. The new system prohibits the use of tax revenues to finance the matching funds. The system would be financed entirely by a small surcharge on penalties and settlements paid to the government by corporations, corporate executives, and wealthy tax cheats. Uh, this system also does not have spending limits and therefore does not run into the problem that the presidential system ran into. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Wertheimer. Um, and next we turn to the Honorable Bradley Smith. Uh, thank you, Chairman Klobuchar, Ranking Member Blunt, and members of the committee. S-1, I think, is frankly a cynical bill. This 800-page bill is not for the people, it's for the politicians. Note that as we meet here today, if a citizen went to congress.gov to try to learn what this bill was about, he would be met with this message. As of March 24th, 2021, the text has not been received for S-1. This rush forward with a lengthy and complex bill suggests a desire to make sure that few of the American people actually understand its impact. But the insiders understand it. Yesterday, in a training session on how to pressure senators to pass S-1, held by an ad hoc group called Declaration for Democracy, a Democratic U.S. Senator expressed his belief that S-1 would eliminate two-thirds of the speech critical of the progressive agenda. And speaker after speaker noted that S-1 was needed because it would silence voices that question the progressive agenda and thus make that agenda easier to pass. The cynicism for the For the Politicians Act is highlighted by two provisions. The first is the point, just noted by Mr. Wertheimer, that the bill claims not to use taxpayer money to fund elections. It then immediately sets up a system using taxpayer money to fund elections. The bill provides that the system will be paid for with fines, penalties, and the sale of government assets. But all of this is taxpayer money, and all of us know that. How cynical is it to claim that the funds of the U.S. government are not taxpayer money, like they're just magical funds that are somehow there? Next is the change in the FEC from a bipartisan organization to an agency under partisan control. How cynical is this? All morning long through the first panel, I listened to one member after another of this committee insist that we had to pass S-1 to do away with partisan redistricting. But apparently, we need to pass S-1 to get partisan enforcement of campaign finance laws. If I wanted to foster distrust in American elections, I could think of few better ways to do it than to change the FEC from a bipartisan to a partisan organization. S-1 will put the FEC under effective partisan control of the Democratic Party through at least the 2026 midterms, longer if a Democrat is elected president in 2024. Now, the cynical claim that this is not true because one member will be independent but we know that there are independents, and then there are independents. For example, currently the Republicans hold a 50 of 48 majority in the Senate, which is why Chairman Blunt opened this meeting, and I'm here as a majority. No, wait, that's not right, is it? That's because the body's two independent senators caucus with the Democrats, and I think it's fair to say that one of those two, Senator Sanders, is further from the typical Republican than is the typical Democrat. Indeed, the FEC technically has an independent now, but he caucuses with the Democrats, was former Democratic leader Harry Reid's attorney, and was appointed to a Democratic seat on the commission on Senator Reid's recommendation. It's cynicism, raw cynicism, to try to claim that this is not a partisan power grab at the FEC. 
Now, the first defense of every rogue violator of campaign finance laws is that the FEC is on a partisan witch hunt. And the response we all know immediately, and I've heard it from Mr. Potter, I've heard it from Mr. Wertheimer, is the commission is bipartisan. Got to have bipartisan majority. If S-1 passes, of course, this will be gone. And if you want to uh, create cynicism, I think having a partisan enforcement body is a good way to do it. Of course, this new partisan FEC will have lots of new rules to write and enforce. Uh, your opening uh, statement, uh, Madam Chair, was correct that the Supreme Court has upheld disclosure. But it was incorrect to suggest, as has been suggested here by others on this panel, that any particular proposals in this act have Supreme Court support. To the contrary, numerous Supreme Court decisions have limited past attempts to expand disclosure in the sort of ways included in this bill. Specifically, S-1 would, would unconstitutionally regulate speech that mentions a federal candidate or elected official at any time under a vague, subjective, and dangerously broad standard that asks whether the speech promotes, attacks, supports, or opposes PASO. This would, in effect, leave the media, which is exempt, in even greater control of public discourse and messaging. But the focus of the bill on identifying who is speaking is also bad for democracy. We uh, should be focusing on issues rather than on individuals and contributors to organizations so that those people can be doxxed and personally attacked, exacerbating the politics of personal destruction and further coarsening political discourse in our country. There's a lot more bad in this bill. Uh, I could go on for some length, but my time is nearing an end. So we'll leave it to say that uh, a detailed analysis of its provisions is available at uh, www.ifs.org by the Institute for Free Speech and in my prepared comments. And I look forward to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, you. And our uh, last witness is um, Tiffany Muller. Thank you so much, Madam Chairwoman. Chairwoman Klobuchar, Ranking Member Blunt, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss S-1, the For the People Act. I would like to thank Senator Merkley for introducing this bill with Chairwoman Klobuchar and leading the efforts in the Senate. I would also like to thank Senator Schumer for recognizing the grave urgency to pass this bill and designating it S-1. And finally, I would like to thank the other witnesses participating today, many of whom, like my colleagues Fred Wertheimer and Trevor Potter, have given decades of service on these issues, as the Chairwoman pointed out earlier. My name is Tiffany Muller. I'm the president of In Citizens United Let America Vote Action Fund, and we are dedicated to fighting the biggest threats to the foundation of our democracy, unlimited and undisclosed money in politics and voter suppression. And I'm pleased to be here to represent our 4 million members nationwide. They are regular people in every state across the country, teachers, nurses, first responders, and business owners, and many more who make this country run. And like too many other Americans, they believe their vo votes don't matter and their voices aren't heard. And too often, they're right. The For the People Act can change that. It ensures people, not just the powerful, are the foundation of our democracy. Americans understand that the money in politics has led to corruption and that ultimately, it's not only impacting their own bottom lines, but their lives and the daily lives of their families. They know corporate interests and big donors have access and influence that they don't. They have seen the impact of a broken Washington firsthand. Here's how the corruption of our democracy has impacted real people in this country. Big Pharma has spent hundreds of millions of dollars on campaign contributions and lobbying since 1990, and it was rewarded with a $76 billion corporate tax cut. But drug prices didn't go down for our members or anyone else, even during this pandemic. In fact, almost one out of every three Americans quit taking medicine they needed this past year because they couldn't afford it. Another example, almost 90% of Americans support background checks for all gun sales. It's not controversial, yet even in the face of horrific mass shootings, including in Colorado and Georgia just this week, Congress has been unable to act. BNRA has spent nearly $130 million in outside money in our election since 2000 and has blocked even the smallest progress. We can look at the response to this horrible pandemic. After an initial bipartisan effort to pass early relief, it took over nine months to allow a vote on much needed additional assistance to American families. 
That delay was largely caused by corporations demanding special carve-outs to give them immunity. That, senators, is money in politics. And money in politics has always been a problem, but the magnitude has exploded since the 2010 Citizens United decision. In the 20 years before that decision, there was $749 million in outside spending on political issues. In the 10 years since, that has skyrocketed to $7.3 billion. And this flood of outside dollars has been driven by a handful of wealthy Americans who often have different priorities than everyone else. And the amount of dark money is increasing at a dangerous rate. Right now, only a quarter of outside spending is fully disclosed, only a quarter. The American people deserve to know who's trying to influence their vote and their representatives in government. And not only are these dark money forces preventing progress on the most important policy issues, but they have launched an all out assault on the right to vote with an intensity not seen since the Jim Crow era. In the run up to the 2020 election, dark money groups funded dozens of lawsuits across the country, attempting to disenfranchise millions of Americans. And after the election, they spent millions more to spread the big lie about fraud and that the election had been stolen. Now they're funding an unprecedented attack on voting rights at the state level. The New York Times just reported that dark money groups are driving this strategy because they believe it's the only way to protect their interests. This all underscores the urgent need to pass the For the People Act and to pass it now. The individual elements of this bill work together to take on corruption, hold government accountable, and put the power into the hands of regular Americans. These are popular common sense reforms to reduce the influence of money in politics, crack down on corruption in both parties, ensure accurate elections, and protect voting rights. They'll benefit everyone regardless of their political affiliation, which is why 83% of Americans, including nearly three quarters of Republicans, want to see the For the People Act signed into law. Thank you so much for having this uh, hearing today on this critical bill, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. I did want to um, uh, clarify one thing, uh, which was stated by uh, one of the witnesses. Um, this bill is publicly available. Uh, it is on the websites of both of the authors, the lead authors of this bill, Senator Merkley and myself. Um, sometimes there is delay in getting uh, bills, especially long bills on Senate.gov, but we all know this is um, very, very similar to H.R. 1. Uh, which has been on the House website for a number of months. There were some technical changes made on the Senate side, and you can compare them if you would like uh, with our uh, bill, uh, but I don't think there's any question that uh, the witnesses uh, knew what is in this bill, and in fact, uh, most of the major components have been out there for years. And with that, I turn it over to uh, Senator Warner. Well, thank you. Um Chair Klobuchar, thank you for uh, holding both of these panels. Um, so I'm, the Honest Ads Act, as you knew, grew out of the, um, what came out of the 2016 campaign, where we saw social media firms who were suddenly being used in politics in a, in a um, dramatically different way than any prior, prior national campaign. Uh, we saw foreign actors. Uh, in, of 2016, oftentimes Russians misrepresenting themselves as Americans on, on social media and then literally purchasing, in certain cases, campaign ads in rubles. Um, we're seeing these efforts to affect domestic elections by foreign actors. Uh, I think that can end up weakening confidence in our political system. Um, Mr. Wertheimer and Mr. Potter, can you speak to ways uh, in which the Honest Ads Act brings long-standing constitutional transparency requirements for uh, uh, politics in a digital age? Yes. Uh, the campaign finance disclosure laws, for the most part, were written in the 1970s. Uh, the Internet did not exist. Computers barely existed in homes. What the Honest Ad Act does is bring the normal disclosure that has existed for decades and that has been repeatedly upheld by, this, by the Supreme Court onto communications, campaign-related communications on the Internet. And I think it's extremely important because 
the internet became a way of evading campaign finance disclosure laws. We know that foreign interests, and Russia in particular, took advantage of the ability to do anonymous, uh, un di without disclaimer ads on the internet. I think it, fa it fills a major loophole in the disclosure laws. Now, I want to make one other comment here. The, the our comment was made that the PASO test was too vague. Uh, and uh, our colleagues uh, who made that comment have their views. But here's what the Supreme Court said about the PASO test. They said it is not unconstitutionally vague. It provides explicit standards for those who apply them. The court said any public communication that promotes or attacks a clearly identified federal candidate directly affects the election in which he is participating, he or she, I would add. The record on this score could scarcely be more abundant. Disclosure is the is the baseline of campaign finance laws. And the Honest Ads Act and the Disclose Act fill gaping loopholes in order that the American people can know when they see communica campaign communications uh, who is behind those communications. Senator Warner. Warner. I'm sorry. Shall I answer Please. Senator Warner as well? Sure. Is Please. that okay, Senator Warner? Yep. Please. I will, I will be quick, which is to say, the two key pieces of this, I think, are one, we're talking about paid advertising on the internet. Uh, paying more than $10,000 for advertising is uh, what then requires uh, the disclosure of the sources of funding. So we're not talking about people sitting at home uh, blogging away, but paid advertising. Secondly, this establishes an archive uh, so that when advertising is paid, people can find out what's said. And that's really important because in the pre-internet world, when somebody paid for advertising in a newspaper or on radio or TV, there was a record of that kept in the business's uh, files or available to the public. You could see it and know who was saying what. On the internet, with targeted advertising, uh, there are communications that can go only to a very small segment of people and no one else will know what's being said, but it's paid advertising. And so that archive uh, would require at least a public record of who is paying for the advertising and communicating with Americans about elections. And I, I know I've jumped line and I will, my time's expired. No, go ahead, you can you just go ahead. One. I, I, I wanna th thank you both and, and recognize that while the social media companies have on a policy basis tried to put some of these procedures in place, we still don't have the law of the land. And I, don't, I think our democracy is important enough that we ought to not rely simply upon the goodwill of Mark Zuckerberg, even when he's doing the right thing. I would only quickly add, and Madam Chair, that one other component that I thought was darn common sense, as we've seen recently, the Director of National Intelligence has come out with a report indicating in 2020 election, we saw uh, Russian intervention again, we saw Iranian intervention, we saw less Chinese, but, uh, but uh, potential for China, uh, Chinese intervention. And I just hope that the fire, the fire act, which is also part of this important legislation, pretty darn simple. It says if a foreign uh, intelligence service tries to offer assistance uh, to a presidential campaign, the appropriate response ought to be call the FBI and not say thank you. Uh, I won't get a chance to ask that question, but I, I appreciate very much that piece of legislation being included. Thank you, Madam Chair. Excellent, thank you. We'll turn to Senator Blunt and then to Senator King. Thank, uh, thank you, Chairwoman. Um, I'm a little hesitant to do this. I only have five minutes. Again, grateful that you're all here, but um, Mr. Goodman, this may be the easiest time to get into your view of this. Do you want to respond to what you, you just talked about and maybe how the Maryland case you think would uh, apply here that you say already has been determined to be unconstitutional, but respond any way you want for maybe a minute and a half, and then I'll interrupt you if I need to. Is your mic on, sir? I'm, I'm responding to uh, Mr. Wertheimer's comment that, that the honest ads provisions would affect campaign-related communications. 
Actually, the honest ads provisions require the pu uh, compel public doxing and disclosure of anyone who wants to speak about any national issue, any public policy issue at all without regard to elections, without ever referencing a candidate for public office, you now have to disclose everything about you and your communications under this bill. Mr. Potter said that uh, there was a trigger of $10,000. That's not the trigger for disclosing who you are when you want to talk online. The trigger there is $500. So anytime someone wants to talk about taxes, abortion, climate change, gun rights, whatever the issue is, and they spend as little as $500 to talk about that issue on the internet uh, in a paid ad, they have to disclose everything about their communication, who they are, and open up their archive. Uh, or, I'm sorry, go into an archive. And one comment about the archive. The, uh, this bill states what its purpose is. It says that we need to identify for counter speakers and fact checkers who said what on the internet. I do not believe that the First Amendment will tolerate a governmental interest that says you must disclose who you are to empower your political opponents to fact check you and to know what you are saying. So All right, these are thank fundamental you. flaws in that. Thank point. you, Mr. Goodman. There are probably other questions by other members on this. Let's go uh, to, uh, to Mr. Smith in the 1974, about the time uh, Mr. Wertheimer was beginning involved in all this, uh, the, the 74 amendments to the Federal Elections Campaign Act took a lot of the enforcement, if not all the enforcement, away from uh, the Justice Department that they thought could easily represent only one side and transferred that to this newly created FEC that would be required to be represented by both sides. Can you give some examples of, in your experience there, what would have happened if any three of the members would have been able to do whatever they wanted to do? I know the law specifically says there'd be five members and any time a majority of them are there, that's a quorum. So that would be three, and our majority of them are currently serving. Let's not, I'm not trying to get into whose absence or hiding from somebody. But what, 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 do you, what do you see as some of the real see. potential problems here? Well, I mean, that's a difficult question. You have to ask about specific enforcement actions. But basically, you're talking about having a partisan majority. And one of the things we know is that not only are there partisan polls, you know, in Washington, the, and you tend, you know, all of us, we're human. We tend to see things through our, our prisms, right? So it's, but it's not really that people might say, well, I'm going to get this person because he's a Republican and I've got three Democratic votes, right? It's also the natural tendency, like most campaign finance laws affect different groups differently. Different groups have different ways of communicating. Republicans do a lot more work with direct mail. Democrats do a lot more work with groups like Act Blue. If you get a partisan committee, it's easy for a group to say, well, what Act Blue is doing seems perfectly reasonable, but that direct mail stuff the Republicans are doing seems like a terrible violation of the law. In other words, you lose that perspective and you have the ability to force things through. So I think it is a, a major problem. And uh, and I, if I can say real briefly, I try and answer your question there, but I do hope somebody will give me a chance to, to talk a little bit more about the PASO standard because I think something Mr. Wertheimer left something very important out of his description of the Supreme Court. Thank All you. All right. Well, others of my right. colleagues are listening on that. Let me ask one more quick question. I think I can phrase it in a way that's yes or no for everybody. On, on this issue of independents who can clearly from all their other activities function as if they were always going to join one side or the other, on March the 12th of this year, Axios published a memo that had been written by, according to the article, quote, a prominent voice in campaign finance reform world, end quote, and shared with White House staff. This memo advocated for finding ways around congressional intent by replacing a current Republican FEC commissioner with a Democrat critically, with a democratically aligned nominee who would probably be an independent but democratically aligned. Uh, yes or no to all five of you did, uh, uh, were you or any organization that you represent or work for, to the best of your knowledge, involved in writing this memo? Not suggesting there's anything wrong with that, but if there is, I may want to ask more questions. Um, uh, 
Ms. Potter? No. Mr. Wertheimer? No. Mr. Goodman? No. Um, and our other two uh, witnesses, uh, Mr. Smith? No. Ms. Mueller? No. No. Well, I thought the five of you were pretty, pretty far into the well-known uh, people who talk about uh, public financing and campaign finance reform and other things. So thank you for those answers. Uh, Senator King, you're next. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Bunn. Uh, Mr. Goodman, I, I'm, I, I'm, I want to ask some questions about your thoughts about disclosure being some kind of violation of the First Amendment. If you give $100 to my campaign, I have to disclose your name, address, occupation. But if you give $10 million to my campaign in the form of a super PAC or against me, uh, there's no disclosure. It, it, I, I don't... I don't really get that. It seems to me the identity of the donor is relevant information for the public, and I don't understand why it's an invasion of a millionaire's privacy to have their names known, and it's not an invasion of uh, my next-door neighbors when I have to disclose their name when they contribute to my campaign. Uh, explain why we have these two parallel systems that just uh, can't be reconciled. Yes. Um Senator, the, uh, uh, the courts over the years have drawn a sharp distinction between the disclosure that is permitted under the First Amendment when someone gives money to a political committee or makes an independent expenditure uh, to fund explicit electoral speech. And uh, the individual who gives your campaign uh, $2,800 per election or one hundred and fifty or two hundred dollars uh, is disclosed publicly, and all of those names are publicly available uh, right. on the internet. When the millionaire Why shouldn't that rule gives apply money to somebody to, that buys ads that says I'm a scoundrel, I, I'm sorry, I, I spoke over you, Senator. I'm sorry, uh, I missed that. Why shouldn't that same rule apply to somebody who spends millions of dollars to buy ads on television during a campaign that says I'm a scoundrel or I'm a saint. Um, uh, the, the boundaries drawn for that are if, an, if the millionaire gives money to a super PAC, then their name is publicly disclosed because a super PAC is a political committee that discloses all of its donors. Now, where the law has drawn the line is the disclosure is permitted constitutionally so long as the speech that it is funding is explicit electoral speech. And in the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, that notion or that realm of speech that uh, can require disclosure was expanded to electioneering communications. This bill, however, this bill would require that disclosure if all you want to do is a year, a year and a half before the election, you want to talk about legislation pending and attach a senator's name to it in a favorable or unfavorable light, this bill would expand that public disclosure to people who want to talk principally about public policy and issues under a vague standard called PASO, where anything that would be deemed uh, favorable or unfavorable about you in that context would trigger disclosure of the people who fund that speech. And I believe that the courts will strike well, I, I that as Well, I don't agree with you that, that there's full disclosure of people. Uh, I, I don't believe that there's full disclosure of people who are contributing uh, dark money to campaigns through 501c4s and, and, and other formats. Uh, I, I just, I, I don't think that happens. In Maine, if you go to a town meeting, you can't wear a bag over your head. Uh, people have a right to know who's expressing their opinions, and that's part of the information that's important uh, to the voters. Uh, Madam Chair, before I go any further, I wanted to mention something in the in the prior panel, and I didn't get to. I think we need to be careful in the bill about uh, requiring paper ballots, which I'm totally supportive of uh, from a, a, a security and, and cybersecurity point of view. But we have to consider people with disabilities, and uh, so that's something that I think we can we can work on as as this bill uh, moves through the committee and and into the Senate. But I think we need to be aware of 
of some of the the, the uh, subtleties here uh, involving uh, people with uh, with uh, disabilities. Uh, Mr. Potter, it's nice to see you. I think you and I were at the last hearing of this Rules Committee on Campaign Finance some five, six, seven, eight years ago with with uh, Justice Stevens. Uh, can you talk to me about the, the disclosure and, and the importance of disclosure? And uh, am I correct that I think dark money comes into campaigns through independent expenditures and we can't find out who they are? Yes, Senator, it's, it's good to be back in this room uh, with you virtually uh, on this subject. We still need work on it. Uh, your question points out why, which is, uh, you're right, somebody who gives you money is disclosed or your opponent money, uh, over $200. Uh, as Mr. Goodman says, if they give to a super PAC, uh, the identity of the person or the entity giving to the super PAC is disclosed. But if they give to a C4, which runs the very same ad that your opponent could be running or that the super PAC could be running, then there is no disclosure of the donors paying for that ad. And as I indicated in my opening remarks, what can happen is that the C4 gets the money and then it transfers it to a super PAC, uh, which spends it. So you end up uh, effectively gutting the disclosure provisions even for the, the super PACs. And, and that's the, the key problem we have here. And that's why we've seen this wave of, of secret money in elections. Thank you. I, I'm out of time. I appreciate okay. the, both you. of your answers. Uh, back to you, Chairman uh, Kovacher. Thank you, Senator King. Uh, next, Senator Hyde-Smith. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And thank you to all of you that are testifying today. It's a great resource to have, and we appreciate your willingness to do this. One of the most concerning portions of this bill for me is the section setting up government funding for financing of political campaigns. This concerns me for two specific reasons. First, we are approaching a $30 trillion national debt. And you know, I firmly believe in addressing this debt is a fundamental responsibility that we have that is necessary to keep our economy at full strength for future generations. Putting the government on the hook to pay for political campaigns is a step toward further unnecessary spending and further debt at a time when we need to be getting our physical house in order. Second, I am concerned that this program will effectively force Americans to subsidize speech that is fundamentally against their beliefs. For example, pro-life Americans will have to pay through their tax dollars for ads promoting candidates who support abortion on demand. Mr. Smith, I'm going to um, ask you about this. I know you've dedicated so much time in defending our First Amendment freedoms, especially as it relates to political speech rights. How might this, this sort of government financing of campaigns envisioned under this legislation endanger rights of consciousness and freedom of speech? Well, I, th I think it's recognized that this is very unpopular, which is why the act, like I say, includes this language saying, oh, we're not going to use any tax dollars for it, but then immediately proceeds to set up a system using tax dollars for it, right? I mean, they're not, they're not income tax dollars, but it's money that belongs to the federal fisc. It can be spent on other things if it's not spent on these campaigns, or we could give it back to the taxpayers, right? So it is, it is government funding. And it is a problem. In fact, the system's more problematic than that because it's got a, a, a big match. I believe it's a six to one match. So, you know, if a party goes out and uh, somebody goes out and gives, you know, 50 bucks to a campaign that you really hate, and it might be somebody really terrible, by the way, we've had cases of, of you know, neo Nazis and so on getting money in some of these programs in the states, then the federal government gives six times that to that candidate. And, and so I do think that's a, 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 you know, a very serious problem that Americans, uh, I, I think, don't like that. I, I prefer to think that we should be funding campaigns, the people, right, not the government. And one of the other problems with this kind of system is that it makes everything 
a scandal. In other words, it leads the government into more and more campaigning. Well, what can you say? They require you to say certain things or not say certain things because now you're spending public money. Once you're spending public money, the government has an interest in how it's spent. And that has very dangerous implications in the long run for, for campaigns. Thank you. Thank you. Also, my second question, while I have a little time left, this law would expand the definition of what's covered by Federal Election Campaign Act to include and paid, any paid internet or paid digital communication, as the conversations we've just had. This comes at a time when we have seen a rise in internet censorship by big tech companies just over the past few years. The problem of social media censorship is affecting so many across our society. I've heard from many just everyday Mississippians who have had their posts blocked or deleted or even their accounts locked because they are certainly monitoring this closely. And um, Mr. Goodman, can you explain what the expanded definitions in this legislation could mean for freedom of speech on social media sites? Um, yes, uh, Senator. The, um, under this bill, anytime you want to talk about a matter of public policy, and you don't, at, you don't even have to mention a politician or a candidate. You are forced to uh, disclose who you are, who your board of directors is, the audience to which you are communicating, and you go into a public file and library for everyone to see who you are, what your home address is, and what you had to say. And this bill also imposes upon the social media platforms, and it's not just social media platforms, Senator. It's the WashingtonPost.com, it's NewYorkTimes.com, it's uh, WallStreetJournal.com. All of these sites that sell advertising on the internet are gonna, this one bill makes them both the policemen to make sure foreign actors don't slip through the cracks, and at the same time makes them criminally responsible if they fail at that task. Now that is a task that the FBI and our National Security Agency failed at in 2016. And now we're putting that burden and making them both police and criminal in one bill. And do you know what the result will be? If we're worried about selective censorship now, these social media sites will simply close their platform because of the cost and burdens and potential liability to all citizens. And that is not a constructive result. It is not pro-democratic. And uh, because we will lose these low-cost platforms for advertising because the cost just will not be worth it. Thank you very much for your answer. I yield, Madam Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, next, Senator Merkley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'd like to enter for the record a letter from the governor of Oregon, Kate, Kate Brown, and a letter also from Democracy for All 2021, as well as an opinion piece that HR1 isn't at all an unconstitutional bill. Since the governor of Oregon grew up in Minnesota, um, is there any objection? <laughs> They're entered into the record. Thank you. There is a strong connection between Oregon and Minnesota in seeking to ensure that every citizen has access to the ballot, that this fundamental American right is guaranteed for all. And I wanted to turn to you, uh, Mr. Potter, uh, in your ex considerable experience, Federal Election Commission, and understand in, in a modest length of time whether you believe that for Congress to put in essentially guidelines for states to follow on congressional elections is constitutional. Constitution says that uh, the states primarily have the right to regulate elections, except that Congress may intervene regarding the time, place, and manner of elections. And over the years, Congress has done that on a number of occasions. So it has superseding authority, which it has used. 
Yes, and that authority is specifically stated in terms of elections to the House of Representatives and to the U.S. Senate. And my understanding of the reasoning behind that was no matter what one of the original 13 states you were part of, because Congress was going to make a decisions affecting all, that everyone in every state had a stake in the integrity of the elections in the other states, and thus created that explicit power in the Constitution. Would that be a fair explanation of um, why that was included? It, it would be, Senator, and I would add that since then, Congress and the states have amended the United States Constitution, specifically with the 14th and 15th Amendments, to broaden the federal role in ensuring that all Americans have the right to vote and people are not denied the right to vote because of their color. So there are other broader provisions now in our Constitution regarding the right to regulate elections in states. As well as the, the 19th for ensuring that women have the right to vote. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Wertheimer, uh, I wanted to turn to you because there's been this discussion about whether it adds to integrity or subtracts from integrity to be able to have people run for office uh, using essentially a matching fund for small donations. And we have had some experience with this around the country. We've had some experience also with the presidential matching fund. Uh, but my impression is that citizens really don't like the idea of bazillionaires essentially buying a stadium sound system to drown out the voice of, of everyone else. So the idea of getting small donations across America where the influence on an individual is dispersed, uh, where no one person can say, hey, you know, I ran $100 million in your campaign or $5 million or $1 million, um, which kind of corrupts. So under this provision, uh, for small dollar donations that have a match, does that increase the integrity or is there some, some fatal flaw in that approach? No, it increases the integrity and it increases the credibility of the way decisions are made around here. So if we really believe in, in government by and for the people, not by and for the richest and most powerful Americans, this system of small donations with matching grants makes a lot of sense. It does. The American people believe, in my view, that big money, influence-seeking funders have far, far too much influence over the way Congress and Washington makes decisions. Uh, the small donor who gives $200 is not going to buy or obtain influence for $200. The donor who gives over $200 million is. The 100 donors who gave $2.1 billion to super PACs are going to get that influence, and it comes at the expense of the Americans. So that very premise of equal representation, that very premise uh, involving uh, that vision of government by the people means that we have to get big money out of these campaigns or to balance it with the opportunity for small donations? Yes, and it, it doesn't change the existing system. Any member of Congress, any candidate can run under the existing system. It gives candidates, office holders, an opportunity to turn to small donors uh, and non-influence uh, non funds uh, if they choose that option, but it frees them from having to depend on and be obligated to big money funders. Uh, thank you very much. My time is up, and I, if I can just close with a short comment. I know that many members here spend enormous amount of time calling the richest people across America on both sides of the aisle to ask for funding or attending little gatherings with the, the richest people in America to, to solicit their, their funds, receive their, their funds. But the idea that one could possibly run for office speaking to p small donors across America, average citizens who care about health care and housing, education, living wage jobs, equality, taking on the pollution in their environment, getting equal opportunity to all, that idea that you're fighting for them seems to me a perfect fit 
with the vision on which our country was founded, government of, by, and for the people. Thank you, Senator Merkley. Senator Haggerty. Thank you, Chairwoman Klobuchar. Um, and thank you, witnesses, for being here with us today. Mr. Goodman, I'd like to direct this first question to you. Would you say that this bill is taking the regulatory approach to essentially control what speech the American people are allowed to hear, rather than allowing them to listen for themselves to a wide variety of sources and decide for themselves what they believe? Um, it, it does, Senator. I, anytime you chill uh, speech, and the mechanism in this bill principally uh, to chill um, uh, Americans' right to speak is uh, through the compulsory disclosure provisions and the expansion of those compulsory uh, exposure provisions to issue speech. And uh, we have documented studies that show we've got two generations of young people who've been raised at, the, at, at heightened levels of intolerance. We have heightened levels of cancel culture, deplatforming culture, and all of the, this bill is, uh, what this bill is, it runs headstrong into that culture war that we are experiencing right now. And so what it does is it chills people's ability and willingness to speak openly both online and through other mechanisms, even about public policy. And what that does is it diminishes people's right to speak. It diminishes all of our rights to hear that speech. And so it diminishes speech overall. Indeed. Indeed. And wouldn't you say that attempting to silence your opponents, to censor what people can hear, and to criminalize those who would say what you don't want them to say is more akin to what you'd see in a totalitarian regime like that of Venezuela or China? Well, um, <laughs> uh, I accept that premise. I'll also add that, you know, this whole idea of uh, public doxing, of public compulsory government disclosure, has been used to censor Americans uh, throughout our history, um, de de depending on who controls sort of prevailing culture at the time. <clears throat> and it has been both, it's been ecumenical. It has, in the Red Scare, the subpoenas that went out to people, and the questions, name the names of your fellow communists or socialists, right? Mm -hmm. um, Southern uh, politicians demanding from the NAACP, give me your donor list in order to do business, even to litigate in my state of Alabama. This, whole, this mechanism of public doxing and compulsory government disclosure has been a tool, a cudgel, to affect censorship of American people, and it has gone right to left and left to right, and today it is left against right. Well, let's stay on that for a minute. Doesn't this public disclosure requirement essentially put a nationwide bullseye on the back of every donor and their family who might contribute to a religious institution or some other institution that at some point in the future might make some political speech that the left decides they don't like. Uh, Senator, that's what it does, because if you're a religious organization and you want to talk about an issue of national importance, take, and, and this is especially acute in, has been especially acute in the uh, uh, social issue arena, mm -hmm. historically, because those are the most sensitive issues and, the, and, and they, they excite the most passions of people on the right and the left, people who support Planned Parenthood, sometimes, if they are disclosed, they have red paint thrown on their front porches, for example. People on the right who support life um, are called names, and uh, they are harassed as well. And it, it, it has grown. And so, yes, Senator, um, and, 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 and Mr. Potter said, and we're going to create an archive. In other words, we're going to find out who said what, when, and we're going to create an archive for all time so that people can go back and find out what group you were associated with uh, for all time. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we may be joined by one more senator, but I will now get to my questions. I've uh, deferred to some of the other senators. Um, so I think I'll start uh, with you, uh, Mr. Potter. Thank you so much as a re former Republican uh, chair of the Federal Election Committee. I think you know a little bit about how this works, and thank you for being here testifying today uh, for the For the People Act. Um, as a former Republican FEC commissioner, uh, do you see this as creating advantages for parties, or do you see it as simply 
allowing people to vote and creating more transparency. And I just, uh, just talk about what this is like, because clearly there's some Republicans who agree with you, especially the polls have shown this. Um, but yet, uh, right now, we're in a, a, a basically a partisan divide on this. And how do you see this as a Republican? Uh, thank you, uh, Senator. To me, I think the lesson we learn over the last 20, 30 years is that it's a real mistake to try to predict what the partisan outcome will be of making it easier to vote. Uh, I do not believe that more transparency in politics helps one party or the other, that greater vote turnout does, uh, that absentee ballots do. You know, I was a Republican election lawyer before heading off to run the campaign legal center, and all of my candidates had major absentee ballot programs on which they spent a lot of money to turn people out uh, and guarantee they will have voted before the election so that if it rained or they were feeling badly, they didn't miss the chance to vote. Uh, so I, I think it's a mistake to look at this through a partisan lens. I think it is better to say, most of these provisions deal with very real problems that have been identified and that the disclosure we will see uh, as a result of this, the issues we're talking about today, the uh, independent redistricting commissions uh, that uh, will be required by this bill in states across the country help people in red and blue states. Mm -hmm. And I certainly, I remember just this week talking to Senator Tester about this, about uh, Montana, they had a high voter turnout because of the vote by mail, but Republicans predominantly won in that state in this last election, but more people voted. And I've certainly seen this ebb and tide in my own state, as I mentioned earlier, uh, where we've had um, some of the most open elections in the country in terms of number of people voting, almost always the highest voter turnout. We've had Governor Pawlenty, and we've had uh, Governor Dayton, and we've had Governor Ventura, and we've had both a Republican and Democratic senators um, with those rules in place. Could you just highlight a bit the um, election, the FEC, of your frustration having been on there and the way it's structured, which was all for good purpose. Um, it was structured uh, before and is structured now and why uh, we would be restructuring it um, and how that could play either way depending on um, who, who won an election. Because sure. there's been claims it's some kind of power grab, but I think it's important to know once we change it, it's, it's changed, no matter who's in charge. Well, I think there are a couple of points that are important. One is that, that some people say, well, the FEC is functioning just the way Congress intended, uh, which is to say it's doing nothing. I don't think that's true. I think you go back and look at uh, the, the Watergate legislation that created it, uh, and what people wanted to make sure is that it was fair, that both parties were involved and that it took a bipartisan majority to take action. And while I was there, that's essentially what happened. It was very much a, I'm going to vote against your guy, but you better vote uh, you know, against mine when this comes up. So there was a, a back and forth. That has changed. We've seen this over the last decade, real partisan deadlock. And the effect of that deadlock is it can't actually take action. It can't open investigations. Uh, because without permission of a majority, there is no way to go forward. It can't do rulemakings, et cetera. I think in terms of the question of whether this is a partisan power grab, there are a couple things I'd note. First, current law says not more than three of any one party. This proposal says two of each party and one independent. And the guarantee there, the safeguard, is twofold. First. This establishes something that I and others have proposed for quite a while, which is an independent, nonpartisan blue ribbon group to advise the president on nominees so that it isn't just party leaders who are doing that. Then you have, of course, the safeguard of the Senate. Commissioners don't get there without Senate confirmation. And finally, and I think probably most importantly, the FEC does not have the ability to find someone it is not a court. All it can do is investigate and say, we think you broke the law, and if you will agree to pay this fine and admit the violation, the matter is over. If you say, no, I didn't, I don't think that's right, then the FEC has to go to court and sue someone 
and get a federal judge to determine that there was a violation of law. So at the end of the day, what we're talking about is an independent finding by a federal judge unless the person admits that they did in fact violate the law. Very good. Thank you for that succinct and actually understandable explanation. Um, Mr. Wertheimer, uh, the Supreme Court is the only federal court in our nation that's not required to follow a code of ethics. And yet they are deciding the most important decisions of our day. And this comes up a lot in Supreme Court hearings in judiciary, but I'm not sure all the senators understand this, that the federal courts, district courts, circuit court, uh, they have ethics rules they have to follow and report things. Could you talk about how the code of ethics that's uh, contained in this bill would help to improve public trust in the fairness of Supreme Court decisions? Well, it's just common sense that the Supreme Court and federal judges should have a code of ethics. Uh, the important part about this provision is that it leaves it to the judicial conference to determine what that code of ethics is. So it maintains an independence for the judiciary. The Chief Justice is the chair of the judicial conference and it's made up of judges. So they will mm -hmm. create their own code of conduct. But Which presumably could be like the circuit court ones they have right now. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make one other comment, sure. if I could. I would like to read to you, since we've been discussing disclosure, what Justice Scalia has said about disclosure. And he said it in a case involving na the names of petition signers. He said the following, requiring people to stand up in public for their political acts fosters civic courage without which democracy is doomed. For my part, I do not look forward to a society which, thanks to the Supreme Court, campaigns anonymously, hidden from public scrutiny, and protected from the accountability of criticism. That does not resemble the home of the brave. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. I'll have one last question of uh, Ms. Mueller, uh, because I, now we're not going to have any other uh, senators, I believe, come. Uh, one last question of you, and I guess it's a good um, segue from the quote that Mr. Wertheimer just uh, read uh, from Justice Scalia. Um, to me, public knowledge is everything about who's making the decisions and who's supporting them and where their funding is coming from. Um, without that, um, it's hard to make informed decisions in a democracy. And uh, do you just want to end things here for my set of questions, Ms. Muller, by talking about not maybe the details. We know we've had some discussions about this, what's in the bill, which is, of course, the Disclose Act, long introduced uh, by uh, many in this body, including um, uh, Senator uh, Van Hollen uh, and when he was over in the House and um, Senator Kane and, and many others. But could you talk about just from your perspective, how that knowledge is going to help and what you see as some of the worst shenanigans that have been going on since the Supreme Court decisions that could be cured by knowledge and also by perhaps uh, public financing. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Senator. It, the American people have really lost faith in who government is working for. Pew's been doing research over the past 50 years on does government work for just a few big interests or does it work for the American people as a whole? And right now, 76% of Americans think it works for just a few big interests. That frankly, those who are writing the biggest check get to have the biggest say in our government. Um, and the fact that so much of that money that's flooding into our election, we had a 2020 election that cost $14.5 billion, more than double the most expensive election that we've ever seen. Uh, and the fact that more and more mo of that money is undisclosed and untraceable uh, just further erodes that confidence in government and who it's working for. And it is absolutely essential to trust in government and to being able to evaluate political claims in political discourse that we're able to see who is funding claims in, uh, in elections. 
Um, and it, that's really what this entire bill is about and what this entire hearing is about is are we going to allow our elections uh, to be controlled by just a few big interests or are we going to give the power back to the people and make sure that we take corrective action to make sure that government is working for the people again. And that's absolutely what the small dollar donor program does too, Senator. Uh, it says that, you know, by voluntary measure that if candidates say they're not going to take big money and they're not gonna take special interest money, that we're gonna empower people to get involved in our democracy. And we've seen this successfully implemented across the country with Republicans and Democratic candidates taking advantage of it. Um, and so to us, that's what this is all about, is restoring faith and trust in our government. Thank you very much. I just wanna clarify, it's Senator Whitehouse who leads the Disclose Act in the Senate. Oh, Senator Blunt, you wanna ask a few more questions? I have or? a couple more, Chairwoman, okay. if, if we have time for that. Before I do that, let me be sure I don't fail. I have a number of letters, statements, press reports, and other documents opposing or raising concerns about this bill that I'll be entering into the record. These letters and statements are from a broad spectrum of organizations that oppose S-1, ranging from the March for Life to the ACLU, uh, and covering a uh, broad spectrum of interest from disability rights to free speech. I'd like to enter those in the record if there's Without no, objection, so no, entered. No objection. Uh, just a couple of questions I have as we finish up, and again, thanks to our, our, our uh, witnesses for being here today. Uh, Mr. Wertheimer, when I was leaving the House, I guess 2008 was the start of my last term in the House, you were helping set up that Office of Congressional Ethics. That was designed to have membership that were almost certain to be of equal number. Do you think now that was a mistake? No, the, the, ethic, the ethics committees have always had equal number right. in this body. Uh, but I don't believe that translates to an argument for keeping the Federal Election Commission the way it is. But you wouldn't expect the Congress to change the Ethics Committee in the Senate to where it had not an equal number. Is that what you're saying? No. I think the Ethics Committees in the Congress have always had equal numbers, and we support that. Well, I, I would think at the time in 1974 that, that was at least one of the models looked at, and I've heard what we said about that. I wonder, Mr. Potter, if the commission suffered, in your view, from having a long period of time, most of the previous 10 years until this committee worked to get six commissioners in place again, it was a long period of time when either there were three commissioners or there was almost never six commissioners. This is uh, looking backward at a time when you weren't on the commission. Do you think that was harmful to the commission? Uh, th there was a period of, there have been two periods of time to my knowledge when it has not had a quorum. And I think that is incredibly harmful to the commission. One was in 2008 and one was much more recently, uh, last year I believe. Uh, so yes, I do. And I think that one had lasted for a while, and then we got a quorum, and then somebody left, and there was no quorum again. We finally do have uh, six commissioners, uh, which was in the last decade not the usual uh, practice, and, and I am glad and was glad to see that. Mr. Smith, in, in the last round of questions I had, you said if you had time, you had a couple of thoughts about uh, the PASO standard. I believe that. Do you want to address that? Yes, thank you, uh, Senator. Uh, it was suggested that the Passel standard had been upheld by the Supreme Court, and it needs to be noted that the Supreme Court upheld that only in the context of political party speakers saying, and I quote, because actions taken by political parties are presumed to be in connection with political campaigns. So generally speaking, you can't apply that standard to everybody else. It's like saying because Ford once won the 24 hours of Le Mans, I could take my Ford Flex out and go win at Le Mans next year. And that's just not not necessarily true. Uh, two other things. It, much has been said about dark money. It needs to be remembered. Dark money constitutes about two to four percent of total spending in U.S. elections, and it has been consistent in that range ever since the Citizens United decision. When we think about it as two to four percent, knowing that much of that is, comes from groups that are very well known publicly, like the NRA, the NAACP, the National Association of Realtors. 
the nature of the problem tends to shrink a little bit. Finally, Mr. Potter, if, if I, I may have misheard him because I can't believe he would, would make this mistake, I, but I thought he, I heard him say that, that newspapers had a political ad file that they had to keep. And of course, that is not true. Uh, and indeed, the type of political ad file that's promoted in this bill was recently held unconstitutional by the Fourth Circuit in Washington Post v. McManus just uh, about 18 months ago in 2019. And I thought those were three points where uh, people should not be left with an incorrect correct impression about what the reality is and the full story. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Ms. Potter, you. did you want to, did you I, misspeak I'm, or is there a disagreement here? I'm not entirely sure I heard Mr. Smith correctly, but my point was that current law requires disclaimers on paid advertising in newspapers, radio, TV, uh, radio, TV are required to keep public files of those any one of us can go and look at a newspaper and see who paid for it. None of that is true for paid advertising on the internet. There is, it disappears and it isn't widely available. There is no way once it has occurred to go back and see what was advertised or who was paying for it. And that's what this would address. Mr. Smith. Uh, I Thank you again, Senator. I'll just say uh, again, that type of broad sweeping public ad file outside the context of public broadcasters recently held unconstitutional in Washington Post v. McManus, Fourth Circuit, 2019. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman. Thank you very much. Uh, do you want to say a few closing words, uh, Senator Blunt? I was going to say a few things. Well, I'm sure we're all going to have uh, plenty more to say about this <laughs> okay. as, as, we, as we move forward. I would say on the issue which still troubles me of thinking every bill introduced in every state somehow represents a, a broad view of the country or the way the country's headed. I would say also as it relates to the 2020 elections in the pandemic, many states stretched as I believe they had the right to do under most of their state constitutions and laws to make it easier for people to vote in a pandemic circumstance than it would be any other time. In some of these so-called suppression uh, movement, uh, bills that may actually be the ones that have a chance of passing, states are looking at that, they're trying to capture what part of that they should make part of their permanent process, which almost always is a much more uh, bigger open door than they would have had prior to 2020 but reflects the likelihood that we're not gonna have a pandemic every election. I, I just think this is, this is not the reason to move forward. Now you can make all the cases you want about why we should do these things, but I think the idea that somehow state legislatures uh, are doing things that will dramatically change everyone's positive view uh, that mentioned the talk today about the 2020 elections uh, is a, a is, a, is, is frankly a, a, a false uh, narrative, and uh, I hope we can talk about the merits of this bill as opposed to what some random state legislature may have filed in a, in a state legislative body that may not even ever have a hearing, let alone have a chance to get on the governor's desk. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Senator Blunt, and I wanna thank our witnesses for appearing today to discuss this legislation, which I consider essential to our democracy. Uh, the testimony we've heard today makes clear uh, that the For the People Act is, uh, to quote Secretary Benson, the Secretary of State of the State of Michigan, as she told us our best chance to stop the rollback of voting rights and to ensure that the voice and vote of every citizen is protected. And yes, we had a turnout like no other, nearly 160 million people in 2020 in the middle of a pandemic. And in a way, it is just tears at your heartstrings to think that people were willing to find a way to participate in this democracy. Democrats, Republicans, independents, people of any political party. It was an amazing moment for our democracy. And I, for one, think that once we've opened that door, of finding ways for people to legally and safely vote that you don't want to go backwards. You wanna keep those reforms in place. 
that that's a good thing. And as uh, former Republican uh, chair of the FEC, uh, Mr. Potter just pointed out, it doesn't always mean that one party wins. The House actually got closer in terms of the majority in this last election. There were a number of uh, statewide elections won uh, by Republicans. But what it means, and I've experienced this big time in my own state because we have the highest voter turnout in the country year after year, is that more people are participating. They feel part of our democracy. They don't feel left out by our democracy. I have people come up to me all the time that say, I voted, well, I didn't vote for you, but I voted, or I voted for you. I wasn't going to, but then I did. They're part of it. They want to talk about it. They're proud that they participated as citizens. And that's what I think we lose that if we start making it harder and harder for people to vote. And I feel the same way about uh, the money in politics as someone that didn't come from a lot of money, as someone that uh, the first race that I ever ran, you could only get get uh, for eight years, $100 in the off election years, that's the maximum you could get from any contributor, and $500 in the election year. That made me reach out to a lot of people and get small contributions for a jurisdiction that included over a million people. And then when I start running for the U.S. Senate, that's a whole different game, but at least there's limits. And that was before all the outside money came flooding in. At least I felt I responsible for the ads that I ran, and my opponent was responsible for the ads that he ran, and I could respond to them on an even playing field. That's being taken away from us, and when that gets taken away from us, we lose the power. So how I look at this bill is that it takes the best practices that have been identified uh, by a number of our witnesses, uh, things that we know are in place um, across the country that worked in red states and blue states, uh, that resulted in this high voter turnout and, according to Chris Krebs, uh, who uh, for a significant period of time was the head of the uh, section of Homeland Security under the Trump administration that was in charge of making sure we had safe elections that both Democrat and Republican senators praised both while he was in his job and when he was unfortunately forced uh, to resign from his job. But before he did that, he said it was the safest election in the history of America. That happened while we found new ways to expand, while we didn't require these notary publics to sign off, uh, while we were able to use uh, vote by mail and in some states register people early. And if I look at, I kept hearing that word chaos, if I look at the chaos, some of it was because after the election was done and it was clear who won on the presidential level, it was lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit. That created the appearance of chaos, but it wasn't actually chaos. It was just votes being counted. And one of the cool things about this bill, um, to get at some of the concerns raised to me by Republican senators during that time period, is that it actually says that the states have to start counting uh, those ballots, processing those ballots when they get them. Because we know we have some states, blue states, red states, whatever, who wait till afterward, and that creates some confusion, I think. So I look at this bill, and I just think when you go through it step by step, there are a number of really good things in this that would make things easier, reduce the chaos as people look at elections so they can believe in democracy. And we know, no one knows better than the people that work in this building, the staff that work in this building, what it means to have people try to undermine an election. No one knows better than former Vice President Pence what it means to be trying to do your constitutional duty and simply count the votes and be there to do your job and have an angry mob come in basically trying to kill you. That's what happened in this place. So I get back to this word chaos. Talk about being able to turn something on its head uh, because what we're trying to do with this bill by putting in some simple, workable standards across the country. And you heard from the Michigan Secretary of State who said she implemented this in a very short period of time in her state that didn't have the Minnesota-like um, ability to make it easier for people to vote. And she didn't have chaos. She had more people vote. That's what this hearing is about. And I do want to thank you, uh, Mr. Wertheimer, for 50 years uh, of testifying and working on this issue. Uh, I'm sure it is 
cathartic to finally be able to testify in the Senate, in this room, um, on this bill, uh, which you've worked on provisions with regard to this bill for so long. Um, and uh, you so well uh, quoted Justice, former Justice Scalia, about the need for transparency, um, the need to figure out what's going on in this country that's an essential part of democracy. Um, and I just want us to take from this, uh, especially in the words of former FEC Republican Chair Potter, um, that in fact, um, this in the end is not a partisan bill. As he said, this bill does not give power to any particular party over another. It gives power back to the voters. So protecting the right to vote, riddling our politics, ridding our politics of dark money spending, and strengthening our ethics laws will only strengthen the voice of all voters, regardless of where they live or which party they belong to, and require people in this building and people elected throughout the country to act for the people. Um, the record will remain open until 5 p.m. on Wednesday, March 31st. I thank Senator Blunt, uh, my friend, uh, for um, helping chair this hearing. I thank all the senators who participated. I think uh, every senator participated in this hearing that's on this committee. Uh, we also are going to continue our bipartisan work uh, on um, a coming up with a very clear, some clear direction of recommendations of what we should be doing in this place to protect our staff um, and ourselves and our frontline workers and Capitol Police uh, from what happened on January 6th. And I thank Senator Blunt and Senator Peters and Senator Portman over in Homeland Security for working with us as we finish that investigation and oversight. Um, and that's been a very meaningful part of our work so far on this committee this year. Thank you, and the committee is adjourned.
Members of the Senate Rules and Administration Committee just finishing up their hearing on campaign finance and ways to combat voter suppression efforts.